We have achieved great things. We have made giant leaps. We've gone far beyond what we thought was possible. But we have only just begun. Our future in space is unlimited, and it will benefit all humanity. But it will take hard work, new technologies, advanced financing models, and enabling public policy. The Beyond Earth Institute is creating a policy and legal framework to enable the creation of economically vibrant communities beyond Earth. We will engage all stakeholders on critical policy issues, property rights in space, norms of behavior, conflict resolution protocols, filling the technology gaps, exploring new financing mechanisms, and making space settlement an agreed goal of the U.S. and its allies. Beyond Earth is committed to the true purpose of why we go to space. Join us on this journey. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar presented to you by the Beyond Earth Institute. My name is Steve Wolf. I'm the president and co-founder of the organization. Uh, and you're here to listen about uh, on a topic on uh, the ASS Bell on My House, an important conversation that we're about to have on ongoing considerations relating to uh, space debris and uh, space situational awareness. Um, before we do that, however, I do want to share with you uh, some uh, updates about what's going on with the Beyond Earth Institute, and uh, if you can, so this is a slide, and we'll we'll do a little bit of an introduction on this in a moment. Um, I want to uh, let's see. Uh, I want to I want to especially thank uh, the Center for Air and Space at the University of Mississippi. Um, for their generous sponsorship of this program. Um, we, again, just a few few highlights here. We, uh, the Beyond Earth Institute this year has, has, um, has launched our policy review. It is a important uh, vehicle for the discussion of critical space policy topics that relate to our mission. So encourage you to go um, and uh, go to our website at beyondearth.org and um, have a look at this, this particular document. The Beyond Earth Business Challenge is underway. This is where we are inviting startups and entrepreneurs and young companies that are involved one way or another in human spaceflight, in human habitation, uh, to participate in a, in a challenge uh, where there will be uh, some, a range of, of in-kind uh, in and cash prizes. Uh, anyone involved in this sector by all means, should look into this and participate. And most importantly, I want to bring up the Beyond Earth Symposium uh, this, this year. It is our third installment. We, with the catchphrase at the crossroads, committing to a permanent future for, for humanity in space will take place November 12th and 13th in Washington, D.C. Complete details are at beyondearthsymposium.org. Um, just want to bring up that uh, we are very happy to announce that uh, Mary Angela Zappia, uh, the Italian ambassador to the United States uh, from Italy, uh, is our honorary symposium chair, and we are very pleased to have her participation. Uh, this the the program uh, is uh, really filling up with um, impressive speakers. These are just the sampling. Our own Michelle Hanlon, who's on the call with us today, will be there. Scott Pace, Kevin O'Connell, Lori Garver, folks, anyone within the, 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 the space policy sector uh, know very well. And as a special highlight, uh, Ron Moore, creator of and, and executive producer of For All Mankind, and who has a long history of writing and uh, directing for um, um, Star Trek, series and uh, Battlestar Galactic and so forth will come and do a fireside chat with us. So we're very excited about that. Again, uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, registration is open. We are, and we are, you know, really just uh, uh, three months away now. So it's very exciting. 
Um, so now our <clears throat> our um, our program today, the ISS Follow My House, addressing the ever-present challenge of space debris. We have an impressive uh, panel here today, um, and I want to um, just really start by introducing our moderator, if I can. Um, and if you just give me a moment, I, I want to do this properly. So Michelle Hanlon, who is an advisor of the Beyond Earth Institute, has been from the very beginning. She's been very supportive of us all along. She is the executive director of the Center for the Center of Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Um, uh, Bram, I see that there are quite a few people that are in the waiting room, if we could let them in. Um, and uh, she is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Space Law, the world's oldest law journal uh, dedicated to uh, legal problems arising from human activities in outer space. And I encourage you to look her up. Uh, also notably, Michelle is the co-founder and president of For, For All Moonkind, a nonprofit corporation that is the only organize, organization in the world focused on obtaining international legal recognition to protect human cultural heritage sites in in uh, in space. So with that, uh, I want to turn the program over to you, Michelle, and uh, and look forward to a great discussion today. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. I, um, and thank you for beyond, to Beyond Earth for putting together this incredible panel. I'm very excited to be here. I think we have a lot of new perspectives to bring uh, together to think about the challenging issue of uh, space debris, orbital debris. Uh, as Steve mentioned, I am the executive director of the Air and Space Law Program here at Ole Miss. Um, from this position, I've seen the growing interest in space and space law. Not only has the enrollment in our program alone increased by thousands of percentage points since I started uh, six years ago, we see more and more space law classes being offered at law schools around the country um, with adjuncts, including some of my fellow panelists here today. I'm also, as again, as Steve mentioned, the co-founder, president and CEO of For All Moonkind and its Institute on Space Law and Ethics. Um, and so a lot of people think, you know, I, I am very much focused on the challenges of lunar governance and how we treat our moon. Um, but all these questions start with uh, questions of sustainability. Uh, orbital debris is starting uh, more and more to have effect on us terrestrially. Um, it can also challenge our access to the moon and beyond. And of course, we also have to consider for another webinar, I hope uh, coming soon, treatment and management of lunar debris and of course, artifacts. But this webinar is focused on orbital debris and we're gonna discuss its impact on earth and on orbit. In the former case, we are seeing a mainstream media flurry of stories about the debris from ISS that damaged a home in Florida, as well as multiple stories about debris, mostly from SpaceX, uh, falling on farms in Canada and glamping resorts in North Carolina. In fact, this has become such a common occurrence that SpaceX has established a SpaceX debris hotline to handle debris discoveries, so much for that liability convention, am I right? On orbit, close calls with larger debris remain relatively rare, but it is well accepted that these two are going to increase, raising concerns about the potential for a disruptive cascading effect as first articulated by Donald Kessler. Today, I am delighted and honored to host quite a distinguished multidisciplinary panel to analyze and discuss the challenges of orbital debris from a variety of perspectives. These individuals likely need no introduction, but if you don't know them, I urge you to read their very impressive bios online. So please join me in welcoming Ian Thomas, the Senior Program Manager at Astroscale Astro US, Chris Johnson, Director of Legal Affairs and Space Law at the Secure World Foundation, Marlon Sorge, Technical Fellow at the Aerospace Corporation, Gabriel Swinney, Director, Policy Advocacy and International Division of NOAA Office of Space Commerce. Thank you again for, for Beyond Earth for putting this incredible panel together. So given the title of this webinar, um, talk about catchy headlines, right? Let's start with the survival upon intentional re-entry of large items, including the chunk of ISS that fell on that house in Florida. Bearing in mind, of course, that NASA is also working on deorbiting a much larger, in fact, the entirety of IS ISS itself within the next few years. So how can that be safe? Um, we're going to start uh, with Marlon, who has the uh, 
the easy job of sort of putting all of this into context for us, you know, sort of the big picture of what we're talking about, the amount of debris, um, and why we're having these discussions now. Uh, Marlon? Right. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to give a little bit of a, a background, um, yeah, looking at kind of the debris and how much is up there and, and why it worries us varyingly. Uh, so at, at this point, we're, we, we've got about something like uh, 28, 29,000 objects kind of in orbit that are uh, being tracked by the, the U.S. Space Surveillance Network. Uh, so in low Earth orbit, uh, that is uh, below 2,000 kilometers. And sorry, I'm going to default to kilometers because that's how astrodynamics is done and everything uh, multiply by two thirds and you get roughly what the miles are. Um, most of the stuff is there. You're talking about, say, um, 20,000 ish objects in, in low Earth orbit. This is where the large constellations are going. Uh, and, and in that region, the, the 20,000 is covering objects that are about two and a half inches across, about the size of a, a softball and up. Uh, and the reason those objects are, are of particular interest, along with the fact that they include the, the operational satellites that we're using, is that that's where most of the future debris would come from. Right? From my perspective, working, working debris um, those are essentially the, the debris that's waiting to happen through, through accidental collisions, through explosions, things like that. So they're the ones that kind of uh, cause the, the sort of self-sustaining growth that we all want to try to prevent. Uh, there's another set of debris that is uh, between about uh, a centimeter and that 10 centimeter mark, uh, which is, we can't track right now. Uh, but is still hazardous. If uh, your satellite, particularly in low Earth orbit, gets hit by something even down to a centimeter, uh, it's likely that your mission is going to be over. Uh, and you say, well, how could that be something that small? But the problem is that everything up there is moving really, really fast. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it's think about it uh, as a rifle bullet, except uh, you've got something that's potentially moving 14 times as fast as that. Uh, so these objects, um, are, are kind of the things we worry about because, as I said, they can end your mission, but we can't track them. Uh, and there's, there's anywhere, the estimates are there's anywhere between about half a million and a million of these objects. And again, the reason for the uncertainty is, of course, that we can't track them. So we have to, there, there has to be some um, measurements that are made uh, and estimates and modeling to try to figure out how much of that's up there. Uh, and then smaller than that, you're talking about millions of objects or hundreds of millions. Uh, and those are, you know, paint flecks and, and things that have just shed off of satellites and, and fragmentation debris, stuff that's happened from, from breakups. Uh, and those can possibly damage a satellite uh, or not. It, it just depends on the design of the satellite and how it gets hit and things like that. Um, so that, that's sort of the environment that we're that we're looking at there. Um, about uh, half of the debris in in low Earth orbit is is fragmentation debris. It's stuff from breakups, from explosions and collisions. Um, what's happened just recently for the first time is the number of satellites, either alive satellites or dead satellites, now has actually passed the number of fragmentation debris. Uh, and that has to do partly with the large number of launches that we've had um, building up uh, these, uh, these large constellations of satellites. So uh, that's definitely changed things. And, and uh, as Michelle said, thinking about the reentry part of this first, that, that also has an effect on how many reentries we're going to be expecting to see. Because the, one of the, the preferred method of getting rid of something out of orbit uh, in low Earth orbit is, is to re-enter, bring it back. Don't leave it up there to fly around and eventually become debris itself. Uh, and um, there are, uh, at this point, somewhere between 20 and 50 objects that come back every month that are you know, satellite sized or bigger. So I'm not counting the, the, the debris, the fragmentation debris. Um, you're, you're potentially talking another another 50 to 100 objects that are coming back that way as well. Um, so there is a, a 
fairly constant rain of stuff that's coming down. Uh, now, I will caveat that with realizing that the Earth is really, really big and relatively these things are very, very small and a lot of them don't survive. Uh, so the actual risk to an individual person is, is still very, very low. Um, but uh, I, as noted, the, the, um, uh, the uh, amount of stuff that's re-entering is increasing um, because we've got more activity that's going on up there. Um, and there's a couple of ways that things re-enter. So there is the, um, the controlled re-entry uh, where you say, okay, I'm going to target a place that, I, that I'm going to put down my, my object. This often happens with like upper stages, great big object. You don't want to just randomly fall somewhere. Uh, and they will uh, often, like with an upper stage, turn around, fire their engines again, and push themselves down uh, into, uh, into the Pacific, uh, someplace safe where there's no people. Uh, the, other, the other type of reentry is uncontrolled. You, you try to bring your satellite down, uh, you know, try to keep it controlled as long as you can, uh, then you dispose of it, and it comes down by itself. Uh, there, the, the reentries are random. Uh, you know, in terms of where they are over the surface of the Earth, uh, kind of depending on what orbit it is. Um, but those are the ones where, um, you know, what Michelle was talking about is an issue where, where you got to be careful and um, uh, try to make sure that your satellites aren't going to be dangerous. So I think you did a, a fantastic and very quick job of sort of setting the stage for us, and I much, much appreciated. Um, so we're talking about controlled entry and uncontrolled entry. I love this concept um, that, that you talked about, this fairly constant rain of stuff that is coming down. And of course, the caveat that um, the earth is big, it's mostly water. Um, it's not like we have to go out and uh, run out and buy uh, you know, space debris insurance for our homes and cars uh, at this point. Uh, but there is a question, uh, Chris, about you know, who is liable? And let's talk specifically because it was it was talked about quite a bit in the mainstream media. Um, you know, the piece of the ISS fell on somebody's house. Who who pays? I mean, SpaceX has a hotline now. And you know, what what happens? What happens if that piece landed on a house in Mexico or Cuba? Exactly. And, you know, I guess I didn't hear about that hotline. I'm going to have to see the details of that and the particulars of it. Um, so first, before I start, I want to say thank you to Michelle and to Beyond Earth Institute for having this event, having this panel. This is uh, uh, a regular topic in, uh, you know, the topic of space debris is critical and central to space exploration and space use. And it's certainly central to the work of my organization, Secure World Foundation, uh, and we see that, you know, space debris is, and responding and, uh, you know, alleviating space debris is central to space sustainability. So this is going to be, uh, you know, it has been for years and it's going to continue to be um, a central topic in, in, in space sustainability and things that we need to talk about. And it, and it really shows that you're serious about space exploration, and space use, when you start looking at the worrying and unattractive sides of space including space debris it shows that you're serious about um you know your intentions and what you want to get done so i'm going to talk a little bit just a little bit about the space law space policy aspects of space debris uh you know i see a couple lawyers in the chat and i will also post in the in the chat a link to the united nations office for outer space affairs and their document international law instruments relating to outer space and regulating outer space so you can get a copy of the outer space treaty and the liability convention Mention, download it for yourself, have it as a PDF and refer to it because the Outer Space Treaty and related documents establish a framework for addressing some of these th these concerns and these issues. And it deals with both responsibility in space and liability in space and who the responsible state should be. So there's a few categories that we find in international law that are relevant here. I'll list them quickly. There's an authorizing state, there's the state of registry, and then there's the launching state. They're usually the same. They should be usually the same, but sometimes they could be different, especially as we see multi-jurisdictional launches and, and cross-border international cooperation for space activities. So first, that authorizing state, the state which is internationally responsible for uh, a, a space activity. We see that in Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, that's the state that is tasked with authorization and supervision, continuing supervision of including of non-governmental actors. And that's the authorizing state is the, the state which could be internationally responsible, meaning answerable for those space activities. That's uh, a critical and important category in space. We also see, and this matters for 
space debris also the state of registry, the state which places a launched space object on its national registry of space objects. We do that, the state does that so that it may exercise jurisdiction control in an extraterritorial fashion into the domain of space and, uh, you know, create laws, pass laws and enforce those laws and enforce disputes. Jurisdiction in space is done through the category of state or registry. And then finally, and importantly, there's the launching state. So there's four categories of launching state, which you can find in the, the liability convention and the registration convention, a state which launches or procures the launch or a state from whose territory or facility a space object is launched. If you're any, any of those states, you are the launching state. And the launching state matters because you could be the state which is internationally liable. Liability is a component of responsibility. Being liable in space doesn't mean that you've broken the law. It merely means that you are now under a duty to make compensation. You are answerable and you're under a legal duty to pay compensation. So if you if your launch space object causes damage to another state space object in space, you could be uh, liable. And if it causes damage on the surface of the earth or to aircraft in flight, you also could be liable. There's differing um, standards of care which we have, whether the damage is suffered on the surface of the earth or whether it is suffered in space. The regime that we have for damage suffered on the surface of the earth is one of absolute liability or strict liability, meaning we do not look at the intentions or the behavior or the standard of care of the actor which caused that damage suffered on the surface of the earth. We merely look for a causal link, the actual and proximate cause of the damage on the surface of the earth. Did you launch the object? Did it cause damage? Uh, if the answer is yes to both of those elements, you are strictly liable or absolutely liable. So when we look at damage on the surface of the earth, it's a very easy test uh, for that uh, actual and proximate cause, absolute liability. But if your space debris is causing damage in space, uh, we're, we are going to be looking at, uh, when we use a fault-based standard, we look a little bit deeper into what you know, what you knew, what you should have known, how you behave, what a reasonable actor uh, could have known and how they would have acted the analysis is a little, is a little bit more diff, diff, difficult and um nuanced so michelle you, i know i've gone over space law very quickly um the responsibility and liability elements of it but you asked about what about the, there's a difference between you know someone who in the u.s who suffers damage uh, when the U.S. is a launching state versus someone elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, international law governs, uh, you know, the subjects of international law are states. The Liability Convention and Outer Space Treaty regulate and assign responsibility and liability to states. And so if there is no international element, then international law is not necessarily implicated. So if you're an American citizen uh, in the U.S. and a U.S space object crashes onto you it is not necessarily governed by international law uh, so you're going to have a tougher time frankly when you start looking at uh, whether you can sue your government how you can sue, or, sue your government and there we're not looking at international law we'd be looking at what is in the say u.s code title 51 to see if there's anything that we can hang a hook on there may be something elsewhere in the u.s code for damage which the government causes to you. And I think I'd leave it at that. I, I know that that's not the perfect answer, but um, that's where we are so far to, to, at the international level. Thanks, Chris. And I, I will point out, you know, the anybody who takes aviation law um, or has studied it will see the parallels here to the Warsaw Montreal regime on private air law, right? If you are on an international flight or if you have booked an international ticket, um, even if you're on the domestic portion of that flight, you might have a very different uh, liability regime to deal with um, and have very different results in terms of if, if something happens or you're injured on that flight. Um, I did want to just say that we will have um, 30 minutes. We've uh, built 30 minutes for Q&A at the end of this session, so I hope that we are churning up enough interest in having some questions. I also wanted to just note, uh, you know, briefly, we have um, all of Space Law. You can hold it in your hand. You can order this from the University of Mississippi, and I will pop um, my my email into the chat in a minute um, if you want to get a copy of that book for the low price of $25 and support um, scholarships here at the Center for Air and Space Law. 
So we we looked at, we've seen we've talked about sort of that controlled reentry that that rain of stuff coming down from the sky. Um, Gabriel, I know that you're not with uh, FCC or FAA, but you are with Department of Commerce and you are our government person um, on this call. How are we how are we managing this risk? How do we regulate you know what's coming down? How do we say that's too big to reenter or you have to make some special uh, comp different concessions or rules about how things are reentered? Yeah, and thanks to everybody for organizing this for the Beyond Earth Institute for organizing it and for you, Michelle, for, for moderating it. Um, just for some brief context, um, many of you in the audience are going to know in the United States government, we have multiple regulators for space activities. Um, we have the Federal Aviation Administration that generally regulates launch and reentry. I'm talking about current current authorities right now. You know, the Federal Communications Commission, um, whose sort of fundamental authority is about frequency and managing U.S. radio frequencies. Um, they have used that authority to also um, regulate some other aspects of in-space activities. You know, if you want a frequency license, you have to comply with certain other rules, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the third one is the office I'm in, uh, the Office of Space Commerce here in the Department of Commerce and NOAA. We have a regulatory division within our office, um, the commercial remote sensing uh, division, and they regulate US-based remote sensing systems. So conceivably, any or all or some combination of those three regulators could regulate um, risk to, and here I'm talking about risk to, let's say, the public or ground assets from re-entering um, space objects, and could use those regulatory authorities that they have to impose certain obligations. In practice right now, it's the um, FAA and FCC that have those rules. And as you said, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, regulatory compliance officers at one of those agencies. So um, I don't wanna speak for them, but in general terms, um, to get a license, um, either a launch or re-entry license um, from the FAA or a frequency license from the FCC, a, a private sector actor has to prove that, um, and I'll say what that means in a second, but they have to sort of demonstrate, let's say maybe better than prove, they have to demonstrate that um, their object will pose less than a 1 in 10,000 risk of casualty on the ground. Now, how you demonstrate that uh, involves a lot of complicated modeling, and there are certain models and certain modeling tools that are um, accepted by those regulators. Um, potentially, I think there's other tools that could be used, but, but in practice, there's a few that a, a sort of companies tend to go to. Um, to model the, the likely consequence of a re-entering object. And of course, it's based on lots of factors about the specifics of that object. Um, and you put that along with your application, and then you get a, a, an approval or not. Um, so that's sort of how we regulate risk right now to space objects in terms of how they re-enter. Um, you know, that still doesn't answer the question then of, uh, that Chris was talking about of what if something happens anyway? Right. What if you are that one in 10,000 or what if, you know, a spacecraft behaved or didn't burn up in a way that you expected? Um, then you are going to have to look at the kinds of questions Chris raised about whether you're international, in which case you have some liability convention and outer space treaty uh, provisions. But if you're you know, a U.S. based actor with a U.S. based object, then, yeah, you're looking just as Chris said, at, at sort of U.S. domestic law. So that's the regulatory system we have. Um, some of you all may know that there's been a lot of swirl in Washington um, on, on Capitol Hill and within the United States executive branch from the White House and the regulators on whether and how we need to update and expand or at least change our regulatory authorities. A lot of that has been focused on whether and how we should regulate non-traditional space activities. But I do think it's important to recognize that you know, if we update or change those regulatory authorities, looking at questions of sustainability writ large um, could and probably will be a critical part of, of those um, of those reforms. So risk to earth, I, I will say just as someone who's um, sitting in US government, um, it's a very rare thing, right? So so it's not always sort of top of mind, either in the, the US space, um, let's say interagency or in the public, um, with the exception of launch, of course, which has to be, you know, risk to the public has to be considered all the time. But it's certainly something that's increasing, right? We had the, the recent incident, and of course, with the um, with the launch of a number of constellations, uh, really 
large constellations, it is something that it probably um, at least might make sense to take take another look at. The last thing I'll flag before I stop here is um, you know, to, to expand our horizon a little bit beyond what the US does. I'll just note that this week, um, the first Chinese mega constellation began deployment um, with a relatively small number of satellites, but for the first of many, many um, that are announced to be deployed within the next couple of years. So, um, you know, the US has the regulatory system we have, we're hoping to make it better. But what other actors, particularly actors with large numbers of space objects do, is going to become um, increasingly important. So I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Gabriel. And, and yeah, I, I uh, hope to get to more of the international aspects um, in a little bit. Um, but I think uh, this, again, I want to stress um, something that I, I think everyone has basically said is, yeah, this is going to happen more often. Um, and and we, uh, Marlon used the term rain of stuff. But again, it's not like this is going to happen every day. It's not like um, we have to sort of go out with shields over our heads so that we don't get hit by debris. And in fact, I think only one human has ever been hit by debris. A uh, woman was hit by a piece of uh, uh, the fabric from uh, one of a uh, space launch, I think in Oklahoma or Nebraska, I can um, look that up. I also want to flag the um, the aerospace report that was incorporated as part of the FAA 2023 report to Congress on uh, debris that is, um, that is going to impact aviation and um, terrestrially as well. So so we're talking, you know, th this is not this is a rare occurrence, right, Anne? I mean, it's, it's not going to happen a lot. But but right now, the US is talking about deorbiting um, space station. Um, that's a huge piece of of stuff that's going to come raining down. Um, leaving aside sort of uh, the issues of uh, how are we going to make sure it's going to land in water instead of on people, um, aren't there other options besides deorbiting? Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the Beyond Earth Institute for inviting me to to chat today. Um, for those that don't know me, Ian Thomas, I do work with a company called AstroScale here in the U.S. At the core of what we do, we are a space sustainability company. And so as we talk about options for the ISS, go into it knowing um, at the core of you know what I believe and what my company believes is that everything that we should do should be promoting the sustainable use of space so that future generations continue to be able to use and operate in space as, as we've been afforded, right? And so... With that in mind, with that sustainability uh, viewpoint in mind, I want to take us back 26 years to 1998 when the ISS began construction. Um, the space industry has changed so much in that time. Um, back then, space launch was still relatively very expensive. Um, projects were mainly state actors, like you said, very large. You know, the ISS was a huge undertaking in and of itself. And it wasn't necessarily something that people went into with the idea of reuse, recyclability, repairability, um, sustainment in mind. And yet here we are, 26 years later, we've had humans operating and living and doing science in space for 24 consecutive years. Um, that is a huge feat in and of itself and needs to be celebrated, right? And so, yes, we're going to talk about what is happening at the end of the ISS's life. Um, but I think we have we have something to celebrate here already when it comes to space sustainment and in the value of repairability and being able to operate and extend the lives of assets on orbit um, that's being demonstrated by the ISS and by other assets and satellites that we have up there today. Um, and so with that, you know, let's talk let's talk next steps. NASA did a study. Um, their result of that study was to do a controlled re-entry of the ISS. And that is certainly a much more responsible uh, approach than just abandoning the ISS to its own devices, as we've talked about, uh, particularly with large objects like the ISS. Um, the survivability of that object to the ground is relatively large. And so if you don't control that, if you don't send that to, for example, the Pacific Ocean, as was mentioned earlier, um, and you leave that to its own devices, that's when things end up on houses or on people. Um, we don't want that. And so as far as you know, the approach that they've taken, yes, that is a step in the responsible direction, uh, fully on board with that. But to your point and to your original question, 
there are other options. And back in 2022, Astroscale, in collaboration with Cislunar and others, uh, submitted a white paper where we, instead of deorbiting the ISS, proposed to repurpose the ISS, uh, change it from being an international space station, uh, you know, fully manned and all the time by people, into a non-occupied ISAM facility. And by that, I mean uh, in-space uh, manufacturing test bed, essentially. So what we would do, there are several technologies in development now. I mentioned our partners over at uh, Cislunar, they're working on orbital refineries where we can melt down uh, the debris that exists up there and turn it into other things, be it fuel rods, be it the foundation for orbital manufacturing and otherwise. The ISS could be repurposed uh, to be the test bed and kind of an initial facility to do that kind of testing, right? Um, it's an incredible amount of mass that is already up there that we've already paid to launch. Um, and rather than just letting it burn up, um, repurposing it and advancing technology at the same time, uh, it creates so many more opportunities to help develop that sustainable um, on orbit environment and ecosystem that we're going to need in place if we want to continue to keep space available to future generations as we continue to, to launch more objects, uh, launch more uh, satellite networks and things like that. And thanks. Uh, so many thoughts about that. I love this concept, though, of this the sustainability aspect of it, because um, I think uh, I'm not, there are groups um, that I'm sure most people are aware that want to save ISS, and but certainly whether we're using it as a museum or whether we are um, uh, creating a, a new ISAM facility, um, it sets a foundation for the future of space travel where we are moving from a, from a, you know, a disposable society to a sustainable society. And I think that would be a very powerful message, not to mention, you know, the fact that we have no idea what the environmental impact will be of deorbiting such a large object at this point in time. Um, I, I just want to, you know, I'm a shameless fangirl of Astroscale. I'm not affiliated with the government or anything, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, a fantastic company. You guys are doing amazing work. And I hope that everybody on the call uh, spends a little time sort of looking at, at some of the uh, the research they've done and the papers they've issued. Um, I also want to point out um, to our friends at Beyond Earth that it seems like we need webinars. We can't have enough webinars on the regulation of non-traditional space activities or what is replacing ISS um, in terms of a commercial LEO destination. Um, but so moving on, you know, I want to, we've, we've really talked about the impact of, of debris on Earth. Um, and uh, Ian brought up, well, you know, what, let's keep station up there. Let's, let's turn it into a non-occupied ISAM facility. Will it be safe? You know, we're talking about orbital debris here. Um, debris is going to have a, a, a tremendous impact on things that are on orbit. Um, so, Marlon, I'm going to go back to you. You know, um, you, you told us there's a lot of objects there. You told us that, um, you know, we, we can expect sort of this constant rain of stuff, not that's going to impact us or, or necessarily cause damage, but just something I think, you know, 20 to 50 objects on any given month just seems like a lot. Again, not in terms of, of uh, uh, safeguarding or harm, but just in terms of, wow, this is a, an, an uptick in activity. Um, so let's now sort of focus on orbit. Um, is, space is big. Um, what are we really worried about here? Yeah, and and that's been uh, one of the challenges. I mean, ultimately, as as probably everybody here is aware, we our daily lives are extremely dependent on space. Um, you know, uh, everything from from getting the weather forecast so that we know the hurricanes are coming to uh, you know, our banking system to just being able to navigate to some restaurant that we want to go to. And uh, so it's, it's become increasingly more important now, especially now that we're looking at, you know, mapping the world every day or using, using space for, for our regular internet, that, um, that we, we keep that maintainable uh, and, uh, and sustainable. And that's where I, I think the challenge comes in here, right? We talked about uh, the debris that we can see, um, that we can dodge. Most of the satellites are capable of, of moving out of the way. 
Um, actually, with these, uh, the new large constellations, they are specifically designed to be able to do that in a very efficient manner. Um, but we do have this, this smaller debris as well that uh, is, is also potentially a problem because we, we can't dodge out of the way. It can take out your satellite, interfere with things. Um, but, you know, overall, I, what's really changed versus, say, 20 years ago is kind of the whole configuration of, of what's going on in space. Uh, so historically, we had a number of breakup events, a number of explosions. Um, that happened because we didn't realize that 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 if you didn't get rid of the fuel, if you didn't get rid of the pressurization on your vehicles, that they might explode. And and we learned that the hard way back in the '80s that that something like that would happen. And so we've we've uh, you, know, insti you know instituted rules that say you need to get rid of all those energy sources. Don't leave a bomb up on orbit. Uh, turns out getting that to work practically is a lot harder than it would seem. Um, but there has definitely been progress in, in, in limiting all those explosions. But we have a consequence of that is uh, there's a region of space uh, between about uh, 800 and 1,000 kilometers where there's a fair amount of this, this fragmentation debris. Um, the, the Chinese anti-satellite tests that they did back in 20, uh, what, 2000, 2007 was also in that same region. Uh, and the problem up there is that uh, it's high enough up that, uh, that the Earth's atmosphere, as thin as it is in space, is so thin there that it has very little effect uh, on the satellites that are uh, on the debris that's up there. Uh, so it's, there's this region where you've got this whole lump of debris concentrated. Uh, and to the point that uh, if you look at where some of these large constellations have been deployed or planning on being deployed, it, it avoids that region of space because, because there's debris there. Um, and I'll note the, big, the other big change has been these large constellations. Um, you know, with, with fragmentation debris, you tend to have a region of space that has a bunch of stuff in it. Uh, in the case of a large constellation, it's very, very concentrated in, in narrow, narrow slices of, of, of altitude ranges, which is where the constellation is. Now, I, I want to note that that's not the same thing at all. The debris is flying around there completely uncontrolled, um, you know, not, not trying to do anything to avoid anybody else. And the large constellations, of course, are, are, are very much more organized. Um, they, they obviously keep themselves configured. They, they dodge all of the stuff that they can see. Um, but but it, it sort of fundamentally changes the shape of, of the debris that's up there. Uh, and uh, as you were noting, e even with that, space is still pretty big. Um, the, the bigger problems are kind of the long term. Um, it's the fact that this stuff, a lot of this debris doesn't go away or doesn't go away quickly. So even if you have an individual time, a very small chance of getting hit by something, if you're up there all the time, and if you leave debris up there all the time, eventually you... Um, lose the lottery, win the lottery, I, win the lottery, but with the bad consequences, uh, that you end up with these accidental collisions. Um, and, and we've had several of those uh, historically where we've seen tracked objects run into each other. Um, and uh, that's you know, one of the sort of big concerns is that we get to the point where those collisions happen frequently enough that they're creating debris faster than, than um, it's naturally going away. Uh, so, you know, in the big picture of debris mitigation, that's really what we're trying to avoid is, is getting ourselves to the point where even if we stopped launching into space, debris would still be, would still be being created. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, th this concept of, you know, this long term um, is something I think it's certainly in the United States, we, we often are very reactive and not very proactive, um, especially when it comes to our environment. And so, you know, it's it's been really interesting to me to watch the developments within the US government um, and the uh, Department of Commerce in particular um, with the new tracks system um, and its space traffic management. And um, among other things, you know, um, I, I noted in March, there was a, a request for information to talk about how NOAA and FCC maybe should collaborate on uh, debris mitigation tactics. And so, uh, Gabriel, I mean, Commerce has been doing a lot. Can you brief us a little bit on that? 
Sure, and I'll work backwards from the things you mentioned. Um, the RFI that came out in the springtime, for context, that was from the regulatory uh, division that I mentioned previously, um, a remote sensing regulatory division. And the question there is whether they should institute debris mitigation rules, this is in orbit now, we're mostly talking about, um, for US licensed remote sensing objects that don't have other licenses from US government, in particular an FCC license. This is a relatively small slice of US objects. Most of the time, if you're gonna get a remote sensing license from us, you probably also are getting a spectrum license from the FCC, but there are cases where someone is downlinking to another country for whatever reason, and they only have that other license, um, which would mean then that the FCC's own debris mitigation rules don't apply to them. And perhaps they fall into a gap where there are no US, at least US origin debris mitigation rules. So the question, and we're asking for industry comment, is whether um, we should fill that relatively narrow gap so that there's um, some consistency and, and lack of um, lack of holes in, let's say, the U.S. regulatory system on on orbit debris. Now, I think there's a bigger question behind all this, um, which is how should the U.S. government regulate on orbit sustainability issues, um, and then I suppose also ultimately on the ground. Um, I mentioned earlier the three regulators that we have as we expand our regulatory authorities to include new activities. Um, the idea is that these three regulators will still stay around, but I think there's an open question and it's ultimately a policy decision really for Congress to make about do you want each of these regulators to be regulating their, their bucket um, of space activities with regards to sustainability and debris? Or do you want there to be a, a single regulator for sustainability and debris? And, or how do you want to slice those pies? Um, that's something that probably Congress needs to address to clarify this. I think one thing we all agree on is that we don't want duplicative rules. We don't want a lot of overlap. Um, and we want to make this as, as easy for industry to comply with best practices as possible. So um, how that all gets sorted out on the US domestic regulatory side will depend on what Congress does. Um, but in the meantime, the, the interagency and we are trying to work to make sure there's no gaps and have consistency to the extent absolutely possible. And I'll just note that um, the vice president at the last National Space Council meeting also tasked NASA and the interagency to work together to update the ODMSP, the Orbital Debris Mitigation Standard Practices, which is uh, a long acronym that is just the set of practices that um, primarily are the basis for US government space activities and how we behave, but also form the at least starting point for, for regulations of the private sector as well. So that update is ongoing. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just say, I, it seems to be going well and I expect that to, to kind of be done relatively soon. Um, you also asked about what else are we doing in commerce? And my colleagues all around me um, are working on the track system. This is the traffic coordination system for space. And I'd say it's absolutely the flagship program of the Office of Space Commerce. Um, some of you all may know that back during the previous presidential administration, Space Policy Directive 3 um, instructed DOD and Commerce to work together to transition um, the mission of providing space situational awareness information, particularly basic safety services, away from the Department of Defense, which currently is the provider of SSA data to really much, much of the world um, for commercial, civil, other activities, um, and transition that public provision of safety data to the Department of Commerce so that DOD can focus much more on, you know, sort of their core national security mission. And TRAX is the system we're in the process of building out to, to do exactly that. It is um, it's an enormous undertaking, a multi-year thing. It's going to be a um, continuously improving process. We're using an agile development process for those who know how software development works, where there's new features continuously added. Um, we're gonna have a set of beta, beta users go live on the system in just a few months this fall, and then we'll be adding more users and more functionality as time goes on. Um, the goal there behind all of this is to have, um, you know, free open space situational awareness made available to the entire space community not just US actors, not just you know governments, but really any operator, certainly, and really the, the general public who needs it um, to be able to understand where their conjunctions, where's their danger, so we can at least minimize them. 
This doesn't solve the problem of space debris, obviously, um, but it is a first step um, to certainly being able to avoid collisions that make more space debris, but also then to sort of do anything about um, to reduce the population of debris that you have. You have to have a really high level of fidelity on what's there and what's dangerous, because not all debris is equally dangerous. Not all regimes in orbit are equally dangerous. We heard a little bit about certain regimes that are worse than others. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if you're interested in the, the technical details of tracks, we hold a bunch of listening sessions. We have a lot of requests for input. We're working with industry and the international community to develop things like standardized data uh, formats. So you can share um, ephemeris data, for example, between systems and with operators. And it, it sort of dives way deep down into the technical details. Um, so feel free to go on our website and sign up for all those things and, and provide input because this is happening like right now. This transition is going to begin in the next few months. Um, and I think it's going to be the sort of the beginning point for almost all U.S. government sustainability efforts uh, moving forward. So again, I, I'm going to fangirl a little bit here. I think it's a tremendous effort and I do encourage you to go to the website because it is very transparent. Um, I think it's almost monthly. There's a new video out explaining uh, the process, where they are in the process. Um, and, and again, you know, sort of making sure there's involvement from industry and the public to understand what's going on and to make sure that, uh, the, you know, the, these regulations are as open um, and uh, effective as possible. Um, it did scare me a little bit, though, Gabriel, when you said Congress needs to decide about the, having a single regulator for debris, because it doesn't seem Congress can decide on much. But um, in light of the um, the uh, this uh, change in the Chevron regime, um, it's going to be really interesting to see. And I think I think Congress does need to step up and and start to. Um, itself behave more responsibly and sustainably at this time. But you also said something really important. You said that um, these efforts are going a, a long way towards towards mitigation. And so again, really important to know, even as a basis for remediation, what's up there, how we're what what is really dangerous. And um, Ian, this is basically what Astroscale does is it looks at remediation. Um, can you t talk us through some of these remediation efforts that are ongoing? Definitely. And, and first and foremost, I would like to start by saying, uh, you know, similar to healthcare, uh, preventative medicine is often the most cost effective best way. And so the mitigation activities that are ongoing, the efforts that are ongoing, um, fully support of those. Um, any debris object that isn't up there is one last thing we have to remediate. But as you mentioned, um, we've been launching things for 50 plus years. There are objects on orbit that need to be remediated. Um, the problem is only going to get worse. And so how do we approach that? Um, it roughly falls into two camps, uh, one of them being what we call uh, prepared clients or remediation of prepared clients, meaning satellites that are being built today uh, that are intended to be refuelable, repairable. Maybe they have docking plates, um, so they're easier to control and navigate for remediation purposes. And then there's unprepared clients. That's the bulk of what's up there right now. And that's a, that's a tougher nut to crack, right? These were launched or built without design principles in mind, allowing them to be remediated. And so, I mean, we can take an example uh, that was mentioned earlier of a large second stage rocket body that's been up there for a while. Um, from a technical perspective, remediation of a large upper stage rocket body uh, will probably start with an inspection, right? There is a possibility that the operators of that uh, asset are no longer in operation. So getting design details and technical details, structural points and things like that that can help you design your remediation mission may not exist anymore. Um, and so an on-orbit in-situ uh, inspection of how best to proceed is, is generally how you would start. Um, from there, you may have to detumble that object. So find a way to grapple or control that object or match its, uh, its tumble through space so that when you actually attach to it, you don't accidentally create additional debris, right? You don't damage it uh, and cause more damage, more uh, risk on orbit. Once you've detumbled it, you've got to migrate it somewhere. Uh, whether that be you know, in geo, maybe taking it out to a graveyard orbit where it's outside of valuable or high risk uh, slots and orbits. In LEO, as we've already discussed, 
what that's looking like right now is primarily deorbiting the asset. So bringing it in either in a controlled or uncontrolled manner, if it's small enough, and um, we think it's gonna burn up, you can maybe do an uncontrolled. Um, but for that large object, you're gonna wanna control that almost all the way down, right? You need to make sure that that isn't gonna be coming down and breaking up and dispersing across land. Um, and so again, uh, large object remediation is a difficult nut to crack. Um, Astroscale is working on that right now. We have a few different missions up there. Our Address J mission with JAXA out of Japan um, is doing the initial stages of inspection for an H2 rocket body uh, that eventually we hope to potentially deorbit as well. Um, but then also on the small side, we, we mentioned some of the smaller objects, less than 10 centimeters. Um, there are some new novel technologies coming online to deal with these, whether it's you know space sweepers, uh, some laser technology is kind of in development and testing right now. But I think the big thing to approach there, um, and I think hopefully everyone on here agrees, is we need better space situational awareness. And so, as mentioned, there are you know millions of objects under that 10 centimeter kind of size range, and we don't really know where all of it is. Um, and so being able to remediate it, one must know where the object is in the first place in order to help remediate it. Um, so, like I said, we've talked prepared, we've talked unprepared, um, regardless of whether it's prepared or unprepared, there are varying masses that we need to deal with. We talked through a little bit of that. The one thing that we've brought up in kind of our approach to the ISS that is maybe not talked about enough, and I would really like to start circulating this because the policy and things need to be happening now in order to sustain this in the future, is a third option, which is, as we said with the ISS, repurposing, recycling, and reuse, right? You don't need to deorbit everything up there if you can reuse it or put it to use or extend its life uh, in some way so that it's no longer just a derelict object uh, up there causing risk to other missions and other operators. And so again, you know, a shameless plug to our collaborators over at CisLunar and others, um, if, you know, as we grow and expand on the technologies available for on-orbit servicing, I think we need to get to a point where it's a circular economy. Uh, as things become less useful for their primary missions, uh, we can you know, repurpose them, maybe regenerate them, put them to use in other ways, or even you know, smelt them down, use them as building blocks for other manufacturing endeavors going into the future. So uh, remediation can take many forms, only you know, one of which has to be uh, bringing it back to earth. Um, but there are a lot of other options out there and a lot of really cool technologies going into practice, uh, specifically on you know, preparing clients to be more uh, repurposeful and, and able to be maneuvered and things like that into the future. Thanks, Ian, and I will join that shameless plug for CisLunar. I knew Gary Cannon way back when, when, uh, when he was, there was just a blip in his mind. Um, so, one thing that you said that um, I think uh, we can all agree on is that that policy needs to happen now. Um, we need to get to change this, this fundamentally change this environment from one of disposable, you know, uh, deorbit into one of sustainable and recycle. Uh, so, Chris, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you know, what what is what is stalling this concept of remediation? It seems like a great idea. It seems it, it seems logical. Um, what are sort of the the policy and legal roadblocks that we're facing here? Well, I can start off that discussion. So, remember that I mentioned earlier Article Eight of the Outer Space Treaty, and states have jurisdiction over their launch space objects so long as they place those launch space objects on their national registry. Well, these rules, which were written back in the 60s, seem to work just fine and seem to be appropriate for how they envisioned space activities back then. That They needed to be able to exercise state regulatory powers into an area outside of state territory, uh, into the, uh, in, an international space. However, this jurisdictional power persists over launch space objects and and its space objects include space debris. When we look at the definition of space object includes its component parts. So space debris are also space objects. What oh, I say that to say this, uh, that's a problem because that means for every fleck of paint, every nut, bolt and screw and piece of space debris, 
there is, it, as it remains a space object, there remains somewhere a state which has jurisdiction and control over that space object and which retains, uh, as I said, responsibility and liability over that space object. It doesn't matter whether it's functioning or not. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether it, the size of it. And um, that means that if we are to remove space debris, um, how do we remove space debris that doesn't belong to us? Space debris that maybe we can't even identify who it belongs to or who was the launching state. So this is a problem that has arisen because, uh, you know, quite understandably, we wrote law, drafted legislation, the Outer Space Treaty Registration Convention, that made sense as we envisioned space activities. But as we've realized, and as the space debris problem has proliferated, this is a a set of rules and a regime that now could cause us a problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, so how do we remove that space debris, uh, especially it belongs to someone else? We don't have salvage rights in space. And um, if a actor is to remove space debris like Astroscale, well, they usually can identify who that owner of that object is and ask them for permission for it. And if need be, uh, um, objects which are placed on a national registry or indeed a UN registry can be removed or they can, you know, the state of registry can be changed for launched space objects, the larger stuff. But for the small stuff, um, you know, we, we don't know who the state of registry is. So is there the possibility of creating some type of salvage rights whereby actors who quite um, maybe for a variety of reasons, want to clean up debris in the space domain. One, because they see that it needs to be done. Two, because they see that there's economic rationales in removing space debris because you, you know, it's f precious metal that has already escaped the gravity well of Earth. It's already in space and we could use it in space. Um, you know, this likely could start at the national level. There could be also um, approaches at the international level and there must be a pro um, address addressing it at the international level to clarify that it is permissible to remove space debris. Otherwise, we would be operating in some type of area of legal uncertainty. I'll leave it at that. Before we go into uh, q and I did want to, and I see Gabriel has his hand up, because I think that, uh, in our prep call, we did talk a lot about salvage, and I think it's an idea that needs um, a lot more uh, voice. So, um, Gabriel, I know you had some yeah, say. thanks. And I appreciate you and Chris raising this because I think it's a it's a really critical one. And I think it's actually an area um, where we can make progress, <laughs> let's say, absent legislation and absent new treaty making. I, I think Chris is absolutely right that solving the problem of unattributable space debris is like, I don't know how you get past the sort of continued ownership. On the other hand, I also don't know who exactly would complain if you remediated some debris that no one could identify who, who it was from. So whether we have like a real practical problem or not, I don't actually know. Um, that aside, the sort of unattributable space debris aside, for larger objects, for the ones that are registered or we do know who they belong to, um, I actually think there's some things we space actors, and here I mean operators, whether they're governments or private sector could do right now um, to sort of juice or get over some of the policy issues. Um, and that's just provide advanced consent. Uh, and I should say, this is not US government policy. This is just an idea we've been playing around with and in the office, but there's nothing stopping, um, you know, space operators of whatever sort from saying, yes, we technically own this object under the Outer Space Treaty. We get that. We're not saying we don't, we're not saying we're not responsible, but we consent now to someone either salvaging it or removing it. Now you're gonna to need to make that consent probably subject to like making sure you don't violate export control rules of your own home country. Um, someone still needs to be responsible and liable if something goes wrong. So there's details to be worked out, but you could go ahead and start consenting to things, right? Continued ownership is only a problem as long as you don't consent to doing something about it. So I think you could imagine space operators maybe even putting up a list and saying, here's 10, 10 dead satellites. These are old tech. There's nothing export controlled in here. Have at them, as long as you do it safely. And maybe we need to make, make an agreement about what safe looks like and who's responsible. There's probably going to be details that have to be worked out. But you could imagine some regime like that, that would get over this hurdle of the continued ownership and maybe 
certainly wouldn't solve the full funding problem of who pays for remediation or salvage, which we haven't really talked about in full detail yet. But maybe, just maybe, it would help companies who are interested in this get more investment, be able to point to you know, those potential investors and say, that object right there is one thing that we could do X, Y, and Z with. Um, and then maybe that could be, be sort of part of the business model. So that's just an idea. It would be interesting to know um, if members of the space community, private sector and governments, um, would be up for that. And to know from companies like Astroscale and others whether that would be would be useful from their perspective. So Ian, why don't we have you um, uh, talk uh, your thoughts or industry thoughts or certainly Astroscale's thoughts perhaps on salvage? Yeah, so first and foremost, I think, um, you know, forward consent or you're setting up the structure to be able to do that is absolutely a step in the right direction. Um, I do think there are some additional concerns there from an industry perspective that are worth uh, looking at on the policy side. And, and I'll just give you an example. Um, if we were to go up and remediate uh, an object that was owned by a, a third party, they gave us consent, all of that, uh, and something were to happen, right? Uh, you know, anomaly, uh, peace breaks off, um, it damages, you know, our satellite or someone else's, the liability around that is now murky. Because as you stated kind of at the outset, um, you know, originally it's you launch it, you're responsible for it, doesn't matter what happens to it on orbit. Well, if, if we're going up and, and messing with it, are you still liable or am I liable after I've, you know, kind of taken control of it? Um, working through that is something that I think we need to do. I think we can probably test those boundaries with U.S. government objects, right? Because I, I think from an industry perspective, having a partner at NOAA or with the Space Force who is willing to, in the early stages, while we kind of perfect and test out this technology, um, assume at least some of the risk, the uh, liability thereof, um, while while we go up and, and do these remediation missions would be helpful. Um, that way, it's not fully burdensome on on industry. Obviously, that becomes uh, you know more difficult as you're working industry to industry, um, or certainly you know even uh, derelict objects that belong to entities that don't exist anymore. And so, yeah, I think the liability piece is something that we need to work through. But certainly, um, you know, just cooperative agreements hey, if I'm not going to do anything with this at the end of its intended life, or I'm not going to meet um, my, you know, deorbit requirements, I am okay with someone else going up and, and doing that on my behalf, I think is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, one other thing I'll just throw out there too, because it, it came up um, actually at Ascend last week. So Jason Kim, who I believe is the chief of staff office of space commerce with NOAA, was throwing around a similar idea um, to the salvage credits um, thinking of it kind of like we do carbon credits here on Earth, right? So maybe there is a a fee to putting something up there, and if you know if you deorbit it or you kind of manage it, remediate it at the end of its life, then that is refunded to you. Uh, if not, someone else can can get that. I think that's an interesting idea to noodle on as well. Um, Thanks. And uh, yeah, I think uh, especially when we, we look at the liability convention, you don't, you know, there's a really no way under international law to lose that liability. So we're going to be talking about what those indemnification provisions look like. Um, and that's that's something hopefully that will be um, sort of ironed out during during the negotiating that cooperative process. Uh, Marlon. Although I'm primarily sitting here as kind of the, the lead for Aerospace's Center for Orbital and Reentry Debris Studies, I'm actually also a member of our, our Center for Space Policy and Strategy. And um, that group uh, has done actually several papers on looking at various different issues related to, uh, to active debris removal, to the remediation, including this issue of how one might go about addressing uh, practically addressing some of these some of these legal issues. So um, uh, uh, some of those papers are, are worth a look. Again, hitting at these same problems of okay, how do we get around some of these these um, older rules that were set up uh, when the uh, space world was extremely different to kind of meet the world that we're living in now. Excellent. Uh I'll have to look up those, um, but I think this is definitely uh, there are a lot of issues. I see Steve said, should we have a comprehensive salvage rights policy? Um, I think, yeah, I think we can we can sort of at least 
continue to outline and offer solutions to some of these issues at a policy level, um, and as Gabriel suggested, maybe start implementing without the need to involve uh, Congress um, at this point. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left. I, there are two questions in the chat that uh, I would like to address. So uh, this is this question is for Gabriel and more related to lunar activities. Uh, the Navajo generated much media attention with their objection to ULA's launch this past January for including thumbnail amounts of human ashes on a lunar lander. They claimed it was a desecration of the moon, which they regard as sacred. And yet there are companies like 30-year-old Celestis, which have been encouraged by longstanding law and policy to pursue business on the moon. What is your office's position regarding such commercial ventures? Does the government think it should be impose a religious test for space activities? Um, you know, I think this, it, it's about a specific example, but I think it gets to the bigger question, which is sort of what is the U.S. government regulating for, right? What are the motivations um, and what do we look at? What criteria as a legal or policy matter um, do we in the U.S. government look at when we give licenses, whether they're FCC licenses or FAA licenses or OSC licenses? Um, and, you know, I think the fundamental answer for that is we are limited by what the law says, right? And I think the recent Supreme Court decision made that abundantly clear that regulators are limited by the authorities granted to them by Congress. And in the case of payload reviews, which is really the only review, regulatory review that's applicable to um, a, let's say a passive payload, like, like human cremains, um, that isn't transmitting, it's not doing remote sensing, it's not like up there doing anything, it's just kind of being in space, whether it's on the moon or not. Um, the only really uh, regulatory process that's relevant to that is the FAA payload review process. And just to underscore what the law is here, the FAA payload review process is limited to the review of public health and safety, safety of property, U.S. national security, or foreign policy interests, or international obligations to the United States. Right, those are the statutory criteria. Um, so if something, if a, if a consideration, however sort of legitimate in some other sense, like moral sense or cultural sense or whatever, um, if it doesn't fit in those categories, it's not a legally cognizable area to regulate a payload review under the current law. And, you know, the US government has looked at payloads like this, passive payloads before, um, Cremains, certainly, but also other types of test payloads, right? Um, and have not found that it violates any of those statutory criteria. Um, I, I guess you could come up with theoretical um, versions that would. Um, really dangerous passive payloads, you know, maybe in orbit in particular. But for things that are going to a known location, aren't really doing anything other than just their mere presence. Um, we historically have not, and I wouldn't anticipate, we would find um, any inconsistency with those existing FAA criteria. And I think that's relevant for the broader question of sustainability as well, right? Because if you do want to do something beyond those criteria, that's where you get to saying um, you do need Congress to act. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Gabriel. I would say, um, yes, it sounds like uh, this is an issue for Congress. Um, and I, I would also point out there, bringing it back to the concept of debris, is um, what on the moon is going to be considered, what is considered debris on the moon, um, especially when we have these passive payloads that are going to be uh, purely commercial. Um, Chris, you had some thoughts. Yeah, and I'll make it brief. I know time is running. Um, this isn't necessarily an issue that I deal with uh, at Secure World, but I am writing a PhD thesis on international legal order for the moon. And um, so I, I look at it from that perspective. Um, you know, this is industrial policy, and it's thinking about industrial policy. If you're trying to spark economic development of a, and, and economic infrastructure, and you are approached by actors to give permits to build, you know, a vape shop, a tattoo parlor, and a bowling alley, but you're also giving, you're also receiving applications to build a school, a library, and, a, and an industrial park for businesses to set up offices in, one of those choices is going to have um, better economic development chances. 
And if your business case for the moon is merely um, cremated human remains and, a, you know, turning the moon into a cemetery, well, there's a cemetery down my, a few uh, miles from here. It's not an economic hotbed of industrial development. So we need to think a little bit deeper about, you know, space 2.0, Space 1.0 may have been these stunts that we could do in space, but uh, actual economic development is looking a little bit deeper into the, you know, the whether this sparks economic development and industrial development. Uh, excellent point, Chris. And I think, um, you know, the other sort of commercial aspect of it, though, is 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 also an international aspect. Um, and one thing that we talk about is if if the U.S. decides uh, we don't want to send uh, cremains to them. We don't want to permit the sending of cremains to the moon. You know, where do you draw the line and who is going to make the judgment call about what is something that um, might spark an industrial segment of the economy and what wouldn't. Um, so, for example, there's a Japanese soft drink going up, I think, with um, uh, iSpace, and uh, it's a wonderful marketing ploy. Take a picture and say, oh, this this soft drink will be, this sports drink will be on the moon, but when the humans return, they'll have something to nourish themselves with. Um, is that is that generating uh, publicity? Is it generating, what, what are the benefits of it? What are the risks of it? And who who is going to decide, I think, is the biggest question for me, who do we trust to make those judgment calls about what should be going to the moon and what shouldn't, um, what is an artifact, what is garbage? Um, I see a, a question from Chuck Dickey, I think um, that will go first to you, Chris, is, uh, so if the ISS part that fell on the guy's house in Naples was under US registration, the individual would file a claim under the FTCA, the um, uh, Federal Tort Claims Act in the United yep. States, Probably their homeowner's insurance company would pursue the claim under subrogation, but if it was a Japanese battery, they would approach their own U.S. government who would diplomatically approach the Japanese government under international law to compensate the injured party. What are your comments? Chuck, I think you've got it correct. Um... This is, uh, you know, I'll make a small plug for, you know, three country trusted broker and we're moving to Brian Orbit. But Chuck seems to seems to say, yeah, that there could be an international component of it. And, um, you know, for the space lawyers that I see the, uh, in our participants today, um, I see Brad Powell out there. Um, along with Laura, you know, start to thinking about joint several liability as we address it in uh, the liability convention. Yeah. Um, I also think uh, it, it, the concept on the Federal Tort Claims Act of whether there is uh, uh, negligence on the part of the uh, U.S. government in this case versus if this had hit instead or if it had been Japanese, we wouldn't have that negligence standard to deal with because it would be absolute liability. Um, I, and we need talk... to build that that standard of care for what actually is fault on orbit. You know, when I look at that, I, we don't know what that is. I don't know what it really means. We can look at practice on, and behavior. We can see best behavior on orbit, but what is the standard at? And can you be risky on orbit? Can you be daring? Or are you held to the same standard for an operator who's operating a pristine, exquisite, large satellite and you're only flying small sets? Are they under the same standard? Absolutely. You know, and, and again, it all sort of boiling down to due regard and what does it really mean to show due regard for people on orbit? Certainly, um, it, it arguably, uh, conducting an ASAT test is not showing due regard for anybody. Um, I'm going to turn, since we have a, a little bit of time and uh, no more questions in the chat right now, um, to sort of the international aspects. And Gabriel, you brought this up in our pre-call. Um, you know, this is this is a universal issue. We're talking about orbital debris that's going to affect everybody. Um, can you speak a little bit to the the international aspects, maybe that your office is working on, or or what you're seeing trending globally? Yeah, um, and there's there's different there's different levels at which you can have this conversation. Of course, um, as I mentioned, space situational awareness is a huge focus for our office right now. So one thing um, that we're doing a lot is talking with international partners, recognizing that we will not be the only providers of space situational awareness information. There will be other governments doing it. There will be private sector actors, so companies providing SSA services. Um, and it's going to be really critical just so that we understand what's going on in orbit and then can do something about it potentially or avoid collisions to be able to compare those systems. 
and say, for example, you know, if one SSA provider tells you you have a conjunction coming up tomorrow, but another provider says you don't, what do you do with that information? Um, is one more accurate than the other? This is like hurricane predictions, right? There's multiple hurricane models out there. And we kind of live with that, but we have a sense sometimes of like, well, this one is better at this kind of prediction and this one's better than the other. So currently the SSA world doesn't really know how to compare those things. We can't look behind the predictions and don't know what to do with that. So we're spending a lot of time talking with other providers to think through not only how do you compare predictions, but literally like how would you compare data or do they follow the same technical standards? Um, do they use the same engineering things that I don't understand? Um, <laughs> so we spend a lot of time working at, at sort of technical uh, systems with um, International Standards Organization or the CCSDS, which is the more commercial standards body, um, and then talk with the providers as well. So on the SSA side, there's a ton of that and it's highly technical, but it's inherently international. And then I think at a, at a more, let's say, basic level, we're starting to have these what does sustainability mean conversations internationally, right? I think we all know that the, the long-term sustainability guidelines came out of UN COPUS, which took a number of years. Now the United Nations system is looking at how nations implement those guidelines. Um, but there's a question about whether you need to go further or update them or add new guidelines. Um, and of course, implementation really um, is the key to the whole thing. Um, meanwhile, we're doing new things in space and private actors are doing new things in space. So it's a multi-level conversation, um, let alone all the discussion we've had today about actual remediation or salvage, which is really at sort of like the very basic level. Um, and I think most of the sort of current progress we've seen on remediation and salvage has happened within single jurisdictions, whether it's countries, like Japan or, um, you know, multinational but in entities like uh, ESA or uh, the EU. So far, we haven't seen a ton of really actionable progress on, on remediation or salvage across national borders. Thanks. It always seems to me, Gabriel, when you speak, you always get my hopes up and then you dash them because I was thinking, you know, if it's technical, right, that's very hopeful because uh, as we've seen, scientists around the world tend to agree with each other and with the science. And so we can, I think, find standards um, to SSA and sort of make qualifications. But then uh, the definition of sustainability falls uh, directly into policymakers and diplomats and politicians. And I think that that is something that um, we will be uh, sort of stumbling over just bearing witness to the the conversations at COPUS about what sustainability actually means. Uh, Marlon, your comments on this? Yes, thank you. So um, maybe maybe some little more optimism in at least in part in in that area as well. So, you know, obviously, we don't have any real um, international treaties. And, and of course, with debris mitigation, I'm hitting on this rather than than dealing with the talking about the SSA part, but the mitigation part of it. Um, don't have any treaties. It's clearly intrinsically an international problem. I mean, as we've seen, one bad actor can mess things up for all of the rest of us. Um, and, but there are places like the, the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, uh, the IADC, where for 25, 30 years now, um, we've, we've gotten together uh, multiple, organi uh, multiple different organizations, um, not always countries that, that are always on the most friendly terms, and, and sat down and said, okay, we need to understand this problem from a technical standpoint and figure out what do we all think needs to happen. And, and IADC has come up with guidelines, specific guidelines about what needs to be done that have then enabled all the different member, member countries to go back to their own home countries and implement those rules. So even though we don't have an, an overarching sort of set of treaties that says, this is what you're going to do, we have kind of the next best thing. We, we come together, we figure out what needs to be done and then take things back and implement them uh, in, our, in our own home countries. It, it's certainly not perfect, but it, it has a lot of the progress we've seen. And, you know, we talk about how big the problem is, but when I started working this area, if you mention space debris, people spit on you, not literally, but figuratively. No, there's not a problem. We track everything. There's no issues. Uh, and to me, the fact that we've got these guidelines that so much of the world is, is 
kind of working toward the same thing faster or slower is, is a huge amount of progress. Absolutely. So which brings me sort of to our wrap up question, you know, what, what is the end game here? And we've talked a lot about what what mitigation looks like, what remediation looks like. Um, what, what does a debris management, a successful debris management environment look like? Um, and I'll, I'll start with with you, Ian. Yeah, I think the end game is an environment in space where we can maximize the value of the assets that we send up there, right? Be that uh, the data science output that they they deliver, be it the the life cycle that they spend on orbit, in order to minimize the amount of objects, the number of objects that we have to send up there. So that's that's number one. Um, but number two is also building out the technologies, the infrastructure, and the cooperative environment in order to be able to do what we need to do for space in space meaning we can do our manufacturing in space, we can do our recycling in space, we can do launching from beyond Earth, right? Uh, you know, we're talking lunar advancements of infrastructure. Um, Astroscale is in the business of ensuring that space, you know, remains usable for future generations. And in that, we do want to use it, right? Space is a valuable environment. And I'm not trying to discourage its use because of potential congestion issues or debris in the future but we have to be able to manage it. And the best way to do that is to uh, propose and develop and foster an environment in space where as much of the economy up there is reusable and recyclable as possible. Reusable, recyclable, salvageable. I think these are our key words in terms of what we're looking for. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the, gist of, of this webinar, I hope, is that um, we really need to think differently um, from the way we've talked it on Earth, being a disposable society. Um, the, you know, the term space traffic management, I think, is really key because this is not close space off. This is manage what we're doing, manage our activities in space so that space, our low Earth orbit, our orbit remains usable, and we have access to uh, the vast reaches of space. I'm going to close just by going back to the title of this webinar, um, you know, the, the ISS fell on my house. Um, I saw a question about um, getting in touch with the homeowner. The homeowner did hire an attorney and a claim has been filed with NASA and I believe NASA has nine or 12 months to respond to it. So we are in a holding pattern uh, with what's going on to that, that piece of ISS that sparked our conversation today. So I wanna thank um, our panelists, um, Ian, Chris, Gabriel, and Marlon. Um, this was really a fascinating conversation. I feel like we've just scratched the surface but um, we did give everybody a lot of uh, material uh, in the in the chat and um, other places you can go to the FAA 2023 report to Congress. Um, Gabriel put in links to the tracks videos um, and tons more information to go through out there. Now over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. And really, this has been a tremendous uh, a panel discussion. Uh, you know. One thing that's really struck me is that um, that you you've done such. We we understand uh, the topic and the challenge, right? So we definitionally where we see what the challenge is, and that we, in some sense, we're moving towards some solutions. The reality, however, is as we discuss and as we talk internationally and nationally, the problem only continues to get worse, right? So. I do feel a sense of anxiety, and I think other folks do, is how do we move towards uh, the, those very real concrete uh, solutions in, in the nearer term? How do we accelerate this process? Uh, it's good that we understand these issues and, and we understand all of the international law aspects of this, but there is a, there does seem to be an anxiety of us trying to really come together really uh, 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 resolving this one way or another. Very excited about what Afterscale is doing. Uh, for sure, they're taking a leadership role. And I think some, some folks in the private sector are not waiting, which is exciting. Uh, you know, what the Department of Commerce is doing in terms of uh, situational awareness, absolutely essential. So that's exciting too. Um, so we, you know, as I mentioned to you, Michelle, and, and to the panel, Beyond Earth has actually traditionally stayed away from this topic because four years ago when we started this organization, we said, well, you know, 
there's so many good organizations, so much great effort going into this area. We're going to stay away from it. But now four years later, we see that we're still ultimately struggling with this topic. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we feel we, we want to, we want to lean into this. You know, I'm reminded of, of my wife when I first started dating her a bunch of decades ago, four decades ago, she was also uh, somebody, one of your panelists said, you know, she said to me, what, I love all the space stuff you're talking about, but what about all this junk we're putting up into outer space? And isn't that, isn't that going to be, are we just trashing up space? And of course I was very naively was assuring her that space was so large and we'd never be able to, we'll never have a junk problem up there. Of course, you know, she was much more insightful uh, than I was as she most often is. But anyway, so Michelle, thank you so much again. And thanks thanks to all of our panelists. It really has been a tremendous uh, conversation. And I thank to our audience. I thank to our folks who had contributed donations for this event. Uh, that is always appreciated and it's an important aspect of this and it helps keep uh, keeps us going. Um, and I look forward to our next webinar and look forward to seeing as many as possible at the Beyond Earth Symposium, November 12th and 13th in Washington, DC. I know Michelle will be there with us and uh, as will others. So with that, thank you all very much and have a great afternoon. Talk to you soon. <laughs>